Well, researchers have been studying many of these for over 100 years. Um, the primary reason why it's been so difficult to understand what's causing many is, is simply the fact that the inner ear is housed in very hard temple bone and it's, it, it, uh, it includes very sensitive structures such that if you surgically try and get into the inner ear to have a look at what might be different, um, you're bound to damage uh, the various structures and lead to uh, additional um, vestibular and hearing disorders. So it's very difficult to get into the inner ear to begin with. Um, Having said that, over the last uh, 50 years or so, um, and even more recently with the, uh, with the advancement of uh, MRI imaging, researchers have begun to get a better feel for exactly what might be morphologically abnormal in, in uh, many of disease ears. Um, that has led to the, the development of various theories of what could be causing many of disease. Uh, one of the most common theories of what's causing many of disease is this uh, thing called endolymphatic hydrops, which is an abnormal increase or if you like bloating of one of the inner ear fluid filled chambers. Um, and a lot of research has been done involving whether or not endolymphatic hydrops is indeed involved in, in many ears disease. Um, we don't yet have a great feel or a great understanding of how endolymphatic hydrops is involved or whether or not endolymphatic hydrops is really the cause of many ears disease. It may simply be a side effect of the underlying pathology. Um, there are also, uh, there's also recent e research uh, that has been investigating various genetic disorders uh, or genetic linkages with many ears disease and also uh, systemic horno hormone uh, abnormalities in many ears disease sufferers and that essentially comes about due to the increasing technology uh, that allows us to assess uh, more accurately abnormal genetic differences and abnormal systemic hormones in many ears sufferers in, in various, in all sorts of diseases but specifically many ears. Um, and a lot of theories have been coming out of, of late about what could be causing many ears. But we're still, we still really lack uh, the reason that the main reason why we struggled to come up with an answer of what's causing many ears disease um, is because we, we haven't had the proper tools for being able to assess and investigate the functional changes that occur in many ears sufferers' ears and, and what's causing those functional changes. We know that many ears sufferers end up with poor vestibular function, we know that they end up with poor hearing function but there is a whole bunch of things, uh, reasons why they might, uh, a person might have uh, abnormal hearing and balance function. What we need is uh, objective tests that focus specifically on what's going, ab going wrong in many of sufferers' ears. And if we can develop those sorts of tests, then we can assess uh, many of disease specifically, and we can assess the progress of many of disease either during the early stages or indeed during the, uh, the clinical trials of various pharmaceutical drugs that might act as a cure. So if we've got a way of measuring many years disease, um, then we can assess the effectiveness of any drug that we might use as a cure. Right, so my research is basically focused uh, on two avenues. The first has primarily been the development of, of techniques that we can use to objectively monitor and measure uh, the functional abnormalities or functional changes that are occurring specifically in, in many years sufferers ears. Uh, one of the one such study that we've been doing lately and one such uh, technique that we've been developing is to m measure essentially echoes from many years sufferers ears. Last year we developed a novel measurement technique involving these echoes from people's ears and uh, we assessed the, this, whether or not this technique could be used to monitor many years disease in its early stages. Um, that technique proved to be quite useful and definitely showed that there were uh, specifically abnormal differences in many of sufferers' ears. Uh, we're now currently, throughout 2011, we're going to be using that technique collaboratively with uh, other researchers based around the world, specifically in, in Italy. And uh, we, we want to ba basically get a better feel for what, uh, what functional differences are occurring in many of sufferers' ears. In addition to these echoes, we're monitoring various vestibular uh, evoked responses um, and we've got various new uh, novel vestibular evoked technique or response techniques that demonstrate functional changes that are specific to many ears sufferers ears as well um, and we're using those vestibular techniques to, uh, so, same as the, the echoes, to assess what functional changes are present in, in early stage many ears sufferers ears so that we can begin to paint a better picture of the timeline of the events and we can formulate a better feel for uh, or a, a better, more accurate theories uh, behind what is actually going on in, in many years disease. Um, apart from the objective uh, diagnostic techniques that we've been developing, uh, we're also doing a, a lot of laboratory based research where we're more heavily focused on what uh, mechanisms uh, in the inner ear 
are responsible for regulating the uh, the normal function and the normal level level of uh, of fluid volume in the ear. Uh, that involves uh, changing the inner ear structures experimentally and observing the effects that those experimental manipulations have on hearing and balance function. If we damage a particular part of the ear and it results in uh, functional changes that are very similar to many ear sufferers' uh, uh, symptoms, then we're going to start to formulate a better uh, model of, of many ear disease if you like. And once we have an accurate model of many ears disease, then we can start to more accurately uh, work on cures for many ears disease in the laboratory, uh, which won't be so heavily reliant upon clinical trials of, of various pharmaceutical drugs.